Hello everybody and welcome to the round glass review for the Super Lentar 21mm f3.8 vintage ultra wide lens. In news that will shock I hope no one, this lens was not made by Lentar because Lentar was not a manufacturer. This lens was made by Tokina. It was distributed in the U.S. by Lenco Photo Products. Lentar was the badge they used for their lenses. This was also sold as the Hanamex Wide Auto 21mm f3.8 and the Soligor 21mm f3.8. It could also have been sold under other badges. Uh, that may not be a complete list here. It was not, however, the Vivitar 21mm 3.8. Insofar as everything I researched indicated, the Vivitar had a different 9.8 optical design and was made by Kino and not Tokina. So we're dealing with the Super Lentar 21mm f3.8. I couldn't find exactly when it was made, but the production style, the Nikon lens mount that I have, and some other factors, uh, namely Lentar's, you know, when they were making these lenses under their badge, indicates this was from the mid to late 70s. Typical lens uses for an ultra-wide include landscapes, potentially with this lens for star trails, though it is a hair slow for that. Uh, architecture is a good use for 21mm, though not with this lens due to some of the optical flaws. Waterfalls will work really well, and surprisingly with this lens in particular, ultraviolet photography. So for your bottom line up front, your too long didn't watch, this lens has a cult following among the ultraviolet photography crowd, and interestingly, as a UV use lens, based on sample photos I saw online, it performs quite well. This also has potential as an APS-C or Micro Four Thirds slightly wide lens, if you like those formats, because they eliminate this lens's corner areas, which is one of the major places where the image quality with this lens falls apart. On full frame, this lens is far less effective as a lens because the corner softness and significant light loss do affect image quality. One other note, in the technical section, we're going to talk about a major, major technical flaw with this lens. If you watch this video to that point, drop a comment and let me know if you figured out what that major technical flaw is before I point it out in the distortion and light loss discussions. I used this lens for about two years before I spotted it. The focal length and AOV are 21 millimeters and 91.7 degrees on full frame, which is 31 and a half millimeters and approximately 70 degrees on APS-C. The aperture range is 3.8 to 16. The element and group count are nine and eight. The design is retro focus. Filter size is 72 millimeters. Closest focus is a hair under 0.3 meters, which in the US is 118 Zoysa days. It's manual focus only. It came in many native mounts for the Super Lentar specifically. The mounts included T4, Minolta SR, Canon FD, M42, Nikon F, and likely others. Dimensions are 75 millimeters by 81 millimeters, and it weighs in at 296 grams in Nikon F mount, which was the mount I used it in. Other mounts are likely to weigh very slightly more or less. Here's my best tip. On full frame, the corners are soft and in an inconsistent manner, meaning that they do not get soft evenly. This is a lens that works best as a semi-wide APS-C lens rather than as an ultra-wide full frame lens. My next tip is not to shoot this lens wide open. Stop down to around f8, the depth of field is significant and the corners sharpen up a little. This lens ghosts dramatically and readily and while most people who have used this lens bemoan the corners, I think the most significant weakness this lens presents is the ghosting. The multicolored circles and hexagons are quite intrusive. Ghosting also often accompanies flare and very much not to the image's benefit. My next up tip, this lens works best with center composed images. Center sharpness is good. Uh, I'm going to waver on that a little bit because it's good by the standards of lenses of this vintage and design price point. Outside of the center, however, sharpness drops off quickly and turns into a lot of blurring and smearing. This is exaggerated at close focus and even stopping down at close focus 
can't eliminate that blurring and smearing outside of the central area. My final tip is to have deep depths of field across your entire frame with this lens. The corner softness and smearing can be largely masked in real world use by having deep depths of field across your entire image. The blurring and smearing tend to stand out much more if you have a flat field that you're focusing, as we'll see in the distortion sample photo, or if you have a shallow depth of field or just say like a rock from a landscape photo in the corner of your image. This lens takes the cake so far for hardest diagram to find. This one was buried in the internet and it took a while, but I found it. And one of the fascinating things with this whole video series for me, and honestly, I hope this is fascinating for you as well, is that sharing the lens diagrams here in these videos shows a lot about how different lenses de designs have advanced through the decades. This lens, for instance, is a classic mid-70s retrofocus lens design. The large blocks in the middle of the lens and also at the rear are not likely to be seen in a modern retrofocus lens. Today, for example, a similar focal length lens with a similar design would likely break those blocks into two or three elements that would be placed glass to glass. Those elements would likely also be a mix of different refractive indices or spherical and aspherical, or they could even have different coatings. Advancements like that specific example are a large part of why modern lenses perform in a more technically perfect manner than do vintage lenses. Sharpness is in the center, maybe bottom right of center a little bit, quite good by the standards of the day and for third party lenses. Outside of the center area, however, sharpness drops off quickly and is not good very fast with a lot of blurring and smearing. This is exaggerated at close focus and even stopping down at close focus, as I noted, can't eliminate that. You can somewhat mask it, as I noted, with having deep depths of field across your image. One other thing we're going to see in the distortion photo is another really good reason not to photograph anything flat with this lens. Really do use this lens if you have depths of field that you can throw across the scene. Build quality is good in keeping with late 70s Tokina lenses. The lens feels solid and the focusing ring handles well. The aperture is stepped in half stop increments too. Contrast varies by aperture with it increasing towards f8. Much of this is due to the propensity of this lens to flare and wide open that flaring is more detrimental to contrast. Aperture stars are quite innocuous six pointed stars. They will add character to source point light in night photos. Out of focus areas are hard to achieve except with close focus and when present, they're fine. Nothing in the out of focus areas will be particularly grating nor will they be overly pleasing. Distortion is an unknown because the corners and sides of the images with this lens are so soft, there's no way to know if it distorts. Now that's a bit of hyperbole. Distortion on the sides is a bit of a wavy barrel distortion, sort of like barrel meets mustache and they kind of compounded each other. And along the top and bottom, this lens exhibits noticeable mustache distortion. A note that the sharpest point of this image is slightly down and right of the image center. Let's talk about that right now with light loss. Light loss is uneven. I'm kind of surprised by how uneven the light loss is with the top left being the worst and the bottom right being the best. This indicates, along with the point of sharpest focus, that this lens is not properly centered because of the way the illumination drops off so unevenly at the corners. So this hints at either some midlife trauma or, and I think this is more likely, the machining or installation tolerances of the mounting components not being as stringent as they are with other lenses, leading to this lens's optical center being slightly down and right of the image area's center. This is backed up, by the way, in the distortion image that we just saw, which exhibits strong sharp, a strong sharpness bias to the area down and right of the image center. Flare is a dramatic and pretty much scene destroying issue if you're shooting landscapes or architecture. If you're on a smaller sensor shooting close up portraits, it might be a workable image element. Ghosting travels with flare, and I just repeat what I said about flare here, but for ghosting, I do not care for the ghosting that this lens creates at all, and it's best to keep bright lights away from the area just outside your image area. 
Balance with cameras is fine with SLRs, either film or digital. On mirrorless, because you need an adapter, that adds a lot of length and throws the center of gravity forward, which makes this lens feel a little front heavy, except on the heaviest of mirrorless cameras. I don't ascribe specific ratings to lenses in these videos, choosing instead to let viewers see the samples and hear my tips and then make a decision for themselves on if they think a lens fits their creative need, or if they can learn a few points about a lens that they already have. Were I to give this lens a rating, it would be a begrudgingly okay one, which is much better than I expected after I used this lens the first time. I am not a fan of this lens, but I do see why it has a following. The center sharpness is good, the perspective is hard to match, and in terms of cost to usability, it's a fair value for what it offers. The Super Lentar 21mm f3.8 does have some significant limitations, however, so if you work within those, then this lens can perform well. That's one of the things that separates a great lens from a not great lens, the limitations, or to put it in pilot speak, the envelope. How large of an envelope or aperture subject focus point combination does a lens return good results in? If a lens is only awesome at f4.5 and uh, with a focus point of 6 feet, it may be amazing for portraits and useless for everything else. Does it make that a great lens? I argue no. But if you're a portrait photographer, this hypothetical lens may be the best or only lens for you. The Super Lentar 21mm f3.8 has two limited usable ranges, around f8 at the maximum focus depth that ends at infinity, and then a second relatively good usable range for close-up subjects, which is within a meter, at around f11. Those are the places where, I think, the photos in this video show the lens performing its best. This lens does a couple of things well. And used in those windows, it's not likely to disappoint hobbyists and amateur photographers. This is a fun lens, without a doubt, and if you like flare and ghosting in your images, and if you know how to use those to creative effect better than I, then this may be an ideal lens for you. Just understand that this lens is far from perfect, far from universally usable, and set your expectations accordingly, and I think then that the Super Lentar 21mm f3.8 will meet or exceed your expectations and keep you happy with what it can do. So here's, I think, the most important takeaway from this video that I can give you. Think back to the distortion photo and the light loss Im images that revealed that this lens has an off-axis optical center. Did you notice it before those images? Before I pointed them out in those images? I didn't. For this video, the last photos I took were the distortion and then the light loss images, and I didn't notice the off-center point of sharpest focus until the last 10 minutes of script writing for this video. Here's my takeaway. Some of the images in this video are definitely above average. Lenses don't need to be technically perfect to make captivating images. If you don't notice a technical imperfection in a lens when you use it, why bother fussing over it? Focus on the one important thing about a camera lens, the images you can create with it.